Hi, this is Randy Randall of No Age and host of the podcast Hyphen It with Randy Randall. I want to welcome our newest sponsor of the show, DistroKid. DistroKid helps musicians get their music on all the major streaming platforms and artists keep 100% of their royalties. Hyphenate listeners get 30% off at distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash hyphenate. Again, that's distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash H-Y-P-H-E-N-A-T-E. Go get your music streaming everywhere now. Hello, welcome to Hyphenate with me, Randy Randall. Actually, this is the Hyphenate halftime. Yes. I set up last time. I'm here with uh, Aaron Farley. He, I banned, <laughs> I've taken him out of the pit of uh, despair, my Halloween-themed uh, um, pop-up uh, basement of torture and plastics and um, blow-molded um, <laughs> light-up <laughs> ghosts. And he's, he's now welcome back onto the show to see if his opinion has changed about his love for Halloween. Uh, this is uh, Monday, September 16th. Uh, Good to talk some Dale Crover, but first, Aaron, how was your week in the spookiest dungeon? <laughs> well, now um, you have me. Now, yeah. now you have me in your creepy attic. Ooh, creepy I've attic! Moved, I've moved into the attic. <laughs> the attic of atrocities. Yes, with, with plastic chains, and <laughs> rubber shackles. Yeah. Um, how has your opinion about Halloween changed yet? Have you have you become a Halloween convert? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, good, good. sure, it's fine. Yeah, I love Halloween's it. Fantastic. Fine. Uh, what do I have to say? What do I have can, to say? <laughs> can, candy corn's the best food. It's a food group now. Yes, I eat yes. 10 pounds of candy corn. And uh, yeah, I love it. It's great. Fantastic. Well, I have to do, I, I do have to say, if, if it's uh, if it's about the candy, then yes, I'm into Halloween. Okay, good. See, yes. you can find an aspect of it you 100%. like. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Waxy chocolates and uh, yes. individually wrapped um, sour things that's yes. I feel like everything's so wrapped now i don't know why i guess we I mean, they must have all been wrapped when we were kids but it's like yeah. so much like i'm just peeling plastic off of things i'm like i think i just ate half the wrapper on all that's a lot of trash candies. i yeah. mean I, I i do think that it's it's interesting how we do i mean it's perfect uh americana that all of our um that that any of those holidays is really just underwritten by a business I, group Big, right. Oh yeah. By big plastic. By big pla- by, plastic organizations. But, but even that that every single holiday. I mean, I think we actually talked about this with, about right. Labor Day. Oh right. Right. Like <laughs> Labor Day, which is supposed to be the day where you talk about how important workers are and stuff, is now like one of the biggest shopping holidays of the year. Yes. <laughs> where people have to go <laughs> to work and and sell things to people. Right. Sell and buy. Sell and buy. Yeah. Well, um, so it's down, actually yeah. it actually is the holiday has just changed. It's like, no, let's, let's talk about how great buying and selling is by going out and shopping instead of going like we're, we're having a respect for everybody who puts so much hard work into this by giving them a day off. We're like, no, 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 no. That's not what Labor Day is. What Labor no. Day is about. Labor Day Profits. is about making people work and showing how important work is for the economy. So let's all go out and shop and, <laughs> <laughs> and make people part. work like, like we're going to stay open twice as long today. Look how important Yay! work is. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and now Halloween. And, and I think it's funny cause I sent you that photo this week of like the, like someone took a photo of uh, their, it was like a class picture from the seven, late seventies, oh yeah. early eighties or whatever. And every kid had their, like, it's like a Superman mask and a, it's just everyone had their plastic smock. masks or yeah. handmade, like handmade costumes and stuff. And, um, and you look at that and go like, Oh yeah, that's funny. But then you start looking at that and you're like, Oh no, that's where like in the eighties really was when it started to become a business. When, when you have, now you have <laughs> like the Halloween store yeah, and you have, you have like five, four months early Michael's putting out their whole Halloween section and you have, you know, target or whatever, like every, it's like, it's Halloween section time. And then right after <laughs> Halloween section time, Halloween, it's going to be Christmas Halloween. section time. Yeah. And, and it really is less, it's less about, you know, like a religious holiday or a, <laughs> or kind of like a community holiday. And it's like a different shopping time. 
It's like, here's now, now it's the time where you shop for this. Now I, it's the I, time where you, sh- and now it's candy. So it's like, even with, with, with Halloween. I, feel like I love more, Halloween time because you're like, oh, I could get a huge bag of candy for like five bucks. It's amazing. The more you describe this, the bigger my smile gets. I know yeah. it's supposed to be negative. I'm like, yes, that's it. You got it. Now you have the spirit of Halloween. You understand mm-hmm. it. It's about IP and uh, buying things and sweet flavors that can only get half of the, one half of the year. Uh, yes. On the balls side. Yeah, pumpkin spice, everything. Yes. Well, I think yes. what's fun is the, those IPs, sort of the masks and then like the, the plastic smock you'd wear that, you know, does, He-Man never yeah. wore a, a – a, a weird like um moo that had he-man written on it yeah you know, he, right. he just wore like you know fuzzy underwear and showed yeah. his muscles but you're a five-year-old kid so your thing is a he-man like face with eye holes cut out of it and then a big thing that's like advertises the new he-man line of action figures that's coming out but like you wear yes. as a cardboard sign and your, your friend repres- next to you has the batman one and then the same thing with the batman kenner toys that are coming out you know it's it's, it's amazing you're walking advertisements <laughs> you know? you're you're repres- manufacturers yeah, you're representing the idea of He-Man. Yes, exactly. That's yes. where I think I first fell in love with it. It's like it's, it's the idea. It's, 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 <laughs> the, it's the idea of of uh, intellectual property. It's all you're just fall in love with ideas of things and playing dress up and the make believe of it all. Yeah, it's like, the yeah. idea of it's like wearing a you know it's like wearing a shirt with a Nike symbol on it. It's like right. You're just representing. You're going like, hey, look, this is cool. Yeah, exactly. This, yeah, this the, that feeling. It's not you that have, the shirt's better than a, any other shirt. It's just that it's just it's just cool. that it costs more. Yeah, it's who I'm represent. <laughs> this is who I'm representing today. Everyone knows the price of this shirt. Everyone knows that this shirt's more expensive than other shirts. Therefore, yeah. when I wear it, I look like somebody who can afford to wear more expensive yeah. shirts. I am That's, into you know, running. At some point. Oh my god! Well, I remember that yes. even growing up with skateboarding too, like going into a skate shop, and and obviously love the core of mom and pop skate shops. You know, were like the lifeblood of the industry. But I remember buying like a girl skateboard shirt, and it was like twenty five dollars. And this is at yeah. the time when you know shirts were like ten dollars. Yeah. But the branded thing, and then or even you know like Pro Decks were over like you know fifty five dollars, sixty five dollars for a deck. Yeah. And you're just like, I get it. Someone's making money off of this, and it, it just you know the trick, the the you know. The trickle down economics of it all, like this, the, you know, the shop makes half of the store, then the writer was got to get paid for it all. Yep. But I remember just even that, like, man, skateboarding is expensive. But I felt like I, I had some, like, I would get like the shop deck or the blank or something that was mm-hmm. a little bit cheaper, and yeah. then and then you'd have to you'd have to get a pair of shoes. But then it was about yeah. skating in like thrift store clothes and like you know dickies, and then just kind of like cheap boards and like or hand me downs or just you know trying to get in with somebody else. Like, oh, can I use your old trucks? My truck's broke. Do you have old yeah. ones? Are you going to get a new pair? And then trying to you know cobbling them together like i couldn't have a whole new complete but it wasn't but it wasn't as fun to skate if you weren't skating like your favorite skaters board like when you had that board and you're like i I got the mark gonzalez no i never really had the the full the full power of the thing i remember skating other people's like toy machine decks i was like ooh, this is good the concave's a little bit better the pop's a little bit better on this yeah i'm going back to my like my utility board shop, you know, yeah. kind of wider one that didn't quite feel as good. But I, I, got, I, I, I bought into all of it, but I yeah. just didn't have the money to actually physically buy it. Yeah. Mentally I, I mean, bought into it, but I didn't have the cash to actually buy I it. I mean, I started out, the, my first good board after having a Veriflex was a, um, I had a Hasoy Mini. Oh, that was yeah. my first board that I ever got. And then, uh, which was amazing. It was like kind of bright. I remember it being like, like bright yellow or something and then those minis were cool because it was almost closer to like what street boards would be because like the ramp boards you were always a little bit wider they were so huge and then then, and then i was in like six i was i was in sixth grade it's like Mm -hmm. 1986 i think uh and then and so the boards back i mean they were massive and i was still a little kid Mm -hmm. and so then when they came out with these minis i was like it's just like a little bit smaller but i felt like it was actually kind of rideable and then Mm -hmm. And then I fully got like tricked out of it <laughs> like a couple months oh, no. later. You want someone, no, it's like the older kids, like one of the older kids were like, were like, Oh dude, I'll, I love that board. I had ridden it for a while. So it wasn't brand new. It was like, I love that board. I'll trade you for a Lance mountain that's used, but also like a pair of better trucks Ooh. or something, something mm. like that. I don't know what it was. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that seems like a good deal. I like Lance Mountain. <laughs> and then I got this board that is more used, definitely. And then my mom was so bummed. She's like, what did you do? I'm like, no, but I got it. And I got these new trucks. And she's like, 
<sighs> Whatever. Just paid all the money. Yeah. <laughs> I totally did not. I was like, yeah, this seems like a good deal. And then, and then, um, so I had that Lance Mountain for a while. But then I think you're right. Then after that, then I started just doing, getting boards that were like boards that I liked. I had this Santa Cruz board that was called the Santa Cruz Special Edition. Oh, sounds yeah, fancy. That was cool. It was like a cool <laughs> design. I remember having a cool design. And then I don't really remember a lot of boards after that. Yeah. I would keep boards for like three years though. That's I didn't it. skate that hard and I wasn't, I was never good. And so I would never <laughs> skate hard enough to break a board and they would just like, you'd slowly just, the tail would become just, unrideable. <laughs> the tail would just become a, like a, totally. a razor blade. Yeah, just totally. A, 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 and then you'd have to even cut it off. Of a weapon. Like, did you ever yeah. get to the point where you're like, well, I'm going to use like the jigsaw or whatever. And I had to cut it no, off because it was so sharp. <laughs> <laughs> cut the little, cut all those your, edges your off every time. Yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> and then, and it would become so like, I don't know, like waterlogged almost. Oh, it God, would just yeah. become like, you'd try to Ollie and it would just go <laughs> <laughs> instead of that Rubber pop. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the pop, it would just go <laughs> 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 when you, when trying. you Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And then once I got to where I was like in, and I didn't skate for a couple of years and I started skating again in college. Like I didn't skate probably for three years in high school where, when it was actually like really cool mm-hmm. pop and the popsicle boards came out and everything. And then, or popsicle stick boards. And then yeah. the, um, then I started skating again in college and then skated after that. But then once I was in college, I'm like, I'm not spending $70 on a board. Give me the, where, where's the blank. And so then it was like blanks yeah. for that, that whole time because yeah. I was, uh, you know what? Actually, I was just too cool. Kid. I was way too cool for like, you know what, man? I don't care, man, about branding, bro. I'm just like here to skate, and I'm just like trying to learn some tricks and be cool. <laughs> no, I would have, I would have eaten all that stuff up if I could, if I could afford it. But I remember oh, I worked at a, I worked at Atomic Garage on Melrose for the summer before, in between high school and college, and it was like, you know, like a cool skate shop on Melrose, you know, yeah, like fun. And uh, I remember, I. I mostly had to just like fold t-shirts. I think that's any like shop kid thing, you know, like mm-hmm. try to work on the shoe <clears throat> wall to, you know, help find shoes for people. But mostly it was just folding shirts and I couldn't watch videos. If they found you like watching the skate video on the TV, they are like, Oh, yeah. we gotta go fold something. If you got yeah. time to lean, you got time to clean. Like, oh, this fucking <laughs> sucks. But I would get to work behind the, um, the, the, like the, the board wall, you know, and then people came in and wanted a, you know, a skateboard put together. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. That was the best part of the, the job. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, yeah, I had, it happened a, a handful of times, but it'd be like a mom coming in with a credit card and I'm like, okay, what do you want? My son wants a, a new skateboard. Like, what should he get? You're like, you know? Ooh. And I'm like, well, here's what I would do. And then I pick out the, like the, the dream board I would want. It's like, here's, yeah. what, here's what's be good. Or, or, you know, I, I wasn't really servicing the kid. It was more just what I, the, the board I wanted to put together. Yeah, it's your board really for 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> You're like this for 20 minutes, sick. I had the new Ed Templeton. Yeah, this is gonna be a sick <laughs> board, dude. Check this out. And I put it all together, and then and then the mom would show the kid. You know, it was like a seven year old. Like, do you like this one? He's like, uh huh, uh huh. She's like, okay, how much is it? And it's like, oh, it's like 150 dollars. Like, Jesus yeah. Christ! <laughs> like the kid's already yeah. over it by that point. And after yeah. I put it together, can we like, go get candy? Just, can we get a like, milkshake? Yeah, like, you're stuck, dude. Have fun. <laughs> 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 Have fun out there. All yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do I was, how do I do this skateboard? Yeah. What do I do? Yeah. But it was yeah. It was always fun. Uh, okay. So Halloween time is good. Oh, did yeah. you ever see? You've never seen Halloween three, right? No, I don't. Oh, okay. No. Of course not. Right. I should. Yeah. But the but the idea of like the the um the commercialization of Halloween is basically what's behind the Halloween three. Oh really? Subplot. It was. It was seen as a failure at the time, but it's now like one of my favorite Halloween movies because it doesn't have Michael Myers in it. It's like a weird. It almost treats the like oh. the genre, like the the franchise as like an anthology. Like okay. this one, like John Carpenter, you know, I think accidentally had a hit with the first one and then was forced to make a second one that was like the first one. Yeah. And then by the time the third one came around, he's like, "What if we just do something totally different?" And this one's about the Shamrock Silver Shamrock um, uh, Halloween Company that makes um, masks for kids. When you put the when you put the mask on and watch the commercial on TV, it activates a piece of Stonehenge that's buried <laughs> inside the mask and turns what? your face into worms. And, and what? makes you like, yeah, t- t- turns your whole head into like bats and worms and terrible things. And like, like you turn into smoke and grossness and that kills all. And the plan is for him to kill all the children. 
of the world rather than by getting the silver shamrock masks and they put them what on. was his idea for wanting to kill all the children was he, he like, was like a, a he was an like orphan? a warlock no it was like he was like oh. a warlock from like you know stonehenge times or something that was oh, like, he's a, like a time traveling yeah time traveling just, possessed and, war, and he had a, and his factory that made these um stonehenge infused children's halloween masks was all run by robots so there's wow. all these like kind of men in black robots that are like doing his dirty work and then they're shipping out all these things. And then this one doctor who's like boozed up and drunk and like womanizing, like yeah. smoking cigarettes and like grabbing ladies at the bar the whole time. Yeah. He's the one that figures it all out. Like, no, it's the masks. We got to, we got Hey babe, you want to jump in the car with me? Come on. We got to go figure this thing out. <laughs> we got to go save gotta, the kids. <laughs> we got to go sleep in a sleazy motel next oh to this God. robot factory that like is going to murder children. And, Do you uh, feel like he it, that John Carpenter was like, "Oh my God, I'm so over this. I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna write the most ridiculous <laughs> thing that will never get funded, and they, they just need me to do something." And he sent yeah. it in. They're like, "This is the one." Yep. I think the That's first it. Halloween you got made it. so He's much like, money. Oh, no. yeah, that, he, that he was cursed with with um, yeah, he could do anything he wanted. But but again, but he was attacking. That, but it came out in the '80s, and it was kind yeah. of at that time, and he was sort of attacking the very thing you're talking about the industry, sort of like, of, you know, the industry of Halloween. Yeah. It's getting away from something else. But I think it also reminds me that, you know, there was, I would love to research this or read a book about it. So I understand it, the, what happened exactly better, but I know there was during the, the, the first Reagan, um, administration there was a deregul you know his whole thing was deregulating things yeah. like letting the free market right. cover itself like the government shouldn't be in charge of these things and one of the things was about like kids tv like that there was regulations that you couldn't just sell toys to kids like through programming like you had to actually have programming and commercials mm -hmm. but he repealed that law deregulated it in a way that now toy manufacturers could just make commercial like you know 28 minute long commercials for their toys and that's where we get gi joe and transformers oh wow and, and like care bears and yeah or he-man specifically too was <clears throat> was a toy first and then they had to come up with like some kind of content through where we what we'd call content now around yeah. it to uh to sell that product. It's a, it was, wow. so the whole thing, so all of that stuff in the eighties was like due to government withdrawing its, its um, protection of kids and TV and advertising and stuff. And then that's and so all the stuff so much easier to just rot our brains from the inside. And that's and that all the generation. stuff that we wanted to, that we latched onto, which yep. is why we're still collectors. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did its job. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It is funny us. that yeah. because I do remember like when in my twenties in that uh, when friends of mine were working in industries that actually made money and started making money, <laughs> that we almost shit. all of us started collecting whatever we wished we could have collected when we were kids. So it's like oh, yeah. that whole, I mean, especially in the art world, like all of a sudden, all those like, what are those called? Like the art pop, whatever those toys were called Funko pops. And, yeah. but, but before that it was like mm. the, the toys, like all artists made, you know, Tim Biscop made a bunch of oh, yeah. like with the different toy companies made like yep. collectible toys. And, and they're definitely not for kids, you know, like right, they're for right. the adults who grew up in times Some where they wish they could collect toys or they were, you know, you always went over to your friend's house who was like the star Wars kid had oh, the yeah. full Star Wars collection or G.I. Joe, had every G.I. Joe or mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, that's like a new thing. Like our, our generation, <clears throat> excuse me, was like the first generation to get marketed to. But I didn't know that about the Reagan. I didn't know there was deregulation with children's stuff. But I do remember, um, I mean, Happy Meals. Oh, yeah. Right? It was like McDonald's way of going like, but how do we get whole families to come in here? Like, oh, we'll make... <laughs> kids stuff and they never and no restaurant or there was that idea never even existed like if you went to go eat burgers you just went to go eat burgers right <clears throat> you weren't going to like buy kids. a toy or or like your restaurant was not marketing with a toy company <laughs> to <Yeah>. like <laughs> to sell to sell like more french fries or or whatever and then um and uh and, but it, it just became so normal of like, oh, wait, if we can get the kids into it, the parents will be like, oh my God, yeah, please. And make a playground too. And <laughs> and then we can eat in peace and we'll just let our kids run around like maniacs all over the place and wreak havoc. But as long as it's on the other side of that door over there and I can just eat my burger in peace, I'll go there every week. Oh but that, God. but I remember even in, in, do you remember that clothing company called Genera? 
you remember no. this company? This might have been before your time. This was because this was when I was in, I would have been in grade school or middle school. And it was like all of a sudden, yeah, so it would have been 85, 86, that like all the kids wanted Genera, which was kind of, fa- it was like fancier clothes, like nicer mm. clothes. And, um, and, uh, Genera and, um, oh, what was the other brand? Oh, like Jordash, oh, Jordash okay. jeans. Sure, yeah. Right. right. And oh, like, well, yeah. All these kind of like nicer things, yeah. but like before that, the even a couple of years before jeans. that. Yeah. yeah. But for kids, oh, but for wow. like, like when kids needed like, Oh, I want that patch on the back <clears> of my <throat> jeans, you know, or whatever oh, that before Oshkosh, that, it was gosh. like, you got Oshkosh and you got Husky, mm. you, you like, <laughs> you know, you had like, you, you had the Husky section. Yeah, like totally. And corduroy pants. It would corduroy make sounds, but it wasn't a brand. It was just like, maybe Oshkosh was a brand, but everything else you just like, you got corduroys and then your shoes were, I mean, what kind of shoes did we have? I don't know. Keds. Keds probably. Yeah. <laughs> Keds and Nikes weren't even really around yet. No. Um, but you Reebok. got, you got maybe like, even, not even, yeah. Yeah. Like, just where, or whatever know. the Target shoes were. You just had the Target like yeah. branded kind and of shoes. You shopped at like Fred Meyer, Fred Meyer and oh, Kmart yeah. and whatever. But it wasn't like, like as a kid, you never worried about a brand. Sure. And then it really was that mid eighties where you're like, oh no, I have, I have, uh, I have Transformers. Like, hey, I got GoBots. Like, GoBots <laughs> suck. <laughs> GoBots are horrible. I remember our parents would only buy us GoBots because Transformers oh, were God. too expensive. It's so hilarious. we had go bots all the time and then we'd find out we're like, Oh, we have to, I can't play with these. I can't play with these with my friends that have transformers. They'll win every time. <laughs> go bots I, never win. <laughs> I used to love, I used to love that thing when like you, you like battle with your friends, like GI Joe's or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, now they're dead. Like, no, 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 they're just sleeping. They're just resting. They're just yeah. hurt really bad. No, yeah. no, no, no. They're, they're dead. They're totally dead. Like no, 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 just just resting. They like, come back. All right, he's back. Like I thought, I killed him already. No, no, he's back. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> it was just like it was like bad improv. Like oh my god, no, just, just said no. Like no, no, I need to be able to bring him back. You can't just kill the character because then then we can't play anymore. You're just gonna kill my character. Like I know that's because I won. Yeah, yeah, better, yeah. better toys. Yeah, Hot Wheels. <laughs> Oh my god! Always had to have the Hot Wheels. <laughs> I mean, so it's funny how much of the stuff still carries on. I mean, gosh, my my five year old still insists totally. on Hot Wheels. Every time we go to the, the supermarket, they have a little rack of Hot Wheels. For, but it's great; that's only a dollar, which is yeah. amazing. Totally, 50, but still needs to get a new Hot Wheels. I'm like you have seventy Hot Wheels, you don't look at. Yeah. It. Like, why do you need a new one? He's like, I need a new one. I tried You're- to have a conversation with them about it the other day. I was like, okay, so what do you mean you need a new toy? Like, what about all those, that room full of toys you have? It's like, yeah, but they're like old. I'm like, okay, so do they not play as well? Like, are they broken? It's like, no, no, they're just not like new. I just need like that new toy thing. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand, make sure, you know, I was kind of messing with them. The human, the human brain needs a shot of dopamine all the time. The newest thing. Yeah. We realize like the new shiny thing. It's just like, it's built in us from so little. Yeah. I mean, I remember. Well, and you're getting to the parenting age of boxes of boxes of old toys, mm-hmm. oh, <laughs> boxes yeah, of unused it. stuff. And what do you what do you do? Like I'm look I'm actually looking at huge boxes of Legos, and I'm oh, looking yeah. at uh, let's see, I'm looking at a Lego house, a Lego Jeep, oh yeah, yeah. and uh, a Lego <laughs> neighborhood. There's In a the Lego attic. neighborhood over there. Yeah, it's all yeah. built. And That's there's a, there's built. boxes of color coded Legos up top. Oh my god. Well, I remember and, uh, that one that one New Year's party you know we had like we brought we brought right over. He was real little; he probably was only four or five. But he was mm-hmm. in the prime Lego spot. And I think your kids were getting out of Legos. And you just oh, had yeah. that, like tub of Legos, and he was just like, "Oh my god, Dad, look what they have! They have oh, this yeah. and they have that. They have this." Yep. And I was like, "Oh yeah, yep, yep." Is that yep. I mean, you know, they're like luckily their their uh, grandparents were big supporters of the Lego obsession, so. <laughs> We would get it was funded They're, every time. Were, yes. Funded, every time but... they'd show up to grandma and grandpa's to BB and papa's, they would, oh, uh, they, Lego there would be home. big Lego kits <laughs> ready for them. they are like, oh, awesome. I <laughs> mean, you. it's great because they actually love it and it's good for them. It's good for their brains and all that stuff. But it's, it's, uh, 
you just go through like, okay, how many bins do we have? How much space do we have? Do we have to get rid of stuff? <laughs> I was good with Legos for about five years. And then I noticed that everything we spent so long building would just turn to rubble. Yeah. And it was never going to go back into shape. And it'd be the, the futileness of it all just really started to wear me down. <laughs> and then I even bought these like little uh, Lego, um, like little divide, you know, like, um, we call them drawers, you know, or like little mm-hmm. dividers or things that were organizers, Lego organizers. Yeah. And I just, it, it was a, it was a meaningless task. I could never keep it together. Yeah. You mean as a kid? No, no. As oh, a, as no, an adult. As, as a dad yeah. now. Yeah. As a dad now. I'm just like, okay, I can't like, you know, yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't be part of this madness anymore. I've helped you so much. I've spent <laughs> many years and years on the trenches building these things. This Christmas is all I can morning, take. Christmas morning, just hunched over <laughs> the thing. And I think especially as my, like, as my reading glasses get thicker, I'm just like, yeah. no, like, yeah, I'm out guys. I, I spent, I did my time with the Legos. If you want, if you want to put these Legos together, you, you're, you're old, you're old enough now. You can figure, you can read the directions. I'm you're on your own. I've given you all the resources I can. This is up to you. I'm not going to build, I'm not going to spend three hours building this thing <laughs> for you only to like th- 30 seconds later, just watch it all turn into garbage. Well, and I think, right. I think that the, uh, that the kits are so insane now. Like if you look back at the old kits from the eighties and nineties, it's like, here's a fire station, you know? And it's like yeah. the big blocks and you have like the little guys. Yeah. And, um, but the, the weird thing, and I guess this actually comes back to the, even the marketing thing too, that they figured out that they can make these crazy kits and then the kids will spend hours on them and then they don't ever <laughs> want to take them apart. Yes. So then you never, ha- so then not never have extra Legos, but you don't have, like, I feel like our Lego kits, you'd actually just buy a One whole pack random. of Legos, but without yeah. a kit. Right. It'd just be like, you have 1000 new Legos and it's just all the different shapes and you're using them to build your own stuff. Yeah. And, and it was meant uh, to build and take apart, but now these are proprietary like colors and things that go for that. Yeah. Kit and so they thing. never take yeah. them apart. And so then you don't have the, I mean, we obviously we still have, like three huge bins of Legos, <laughs> but, uh, but that they don't ever build their own things with them. Do your oh. kids ever build their own things? Oh yeah. Do all they? The okay. Yeah, that's, all, good. that's good. But the, I mean, the frustration of watching a five-year-old trying to put this whole thing together, that's, just, that's, that's just, you know, fractured it all based on like one little, like, cube like the yeah. whole thing's built he doesn't quite understand architecture or yeah. strength as so i try yeah. to encourage him like we got a wider at the bottom smaller at the top like yeah. pyramid shaped things like no no no, it's all gonna go like this and then the frustration just as it breaks over and over again yeah <laughs> like could you fix this i'm like the, the, design, the design welcome is. to life kid yeah <laughs> this is like, this is the story of life right here he's like what if i add all these things to it no no that's all hinge on this on the flower pot if the flower pot isn't the linchpin to this entire structure <laughs> then i like, don't want to i don't want to build it I'm like, well, yeah here, here it's not going to work i got, I got yeah. this for you i hate um, this yeah you know, it always ends in crying crying yeah. and frustration but yes they will build things but but very they'll only happy for about you know the first hour and then which yeah. is, i guess what what else do you want that's fine if they get an hour of quietness yeah. if you really, can if you can get you know. a kid to do something for an hour you're a genius yeah that's true maybe even like middle school age <laughs> maybe it's not a full hour but in my mind okay <laughs> an but hour i just i hear that i hear them it's quiet and then just like the slush of like tubs of legos like whoosh whoosh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They'll try to find a spot and just that like the it's sound like, of Legos slushing around in a in a plastic tub. It's like hearing the waves uh, yeah, on is. the beach. Yeah. It's, it's like relaxing. very yeah. it's relaxing, like oh, <laughs> sound. I never have heard a better sound than Legos being sloshed around <laughs> in a bin. <laughs> we should come up with some kind of ASMR like thing for parents. dads. For or for parents or for dads, you know, specifically for dads, like the sound that you want to hear as a parent, like the quiet, you know, the quietness of the kids not breaking things. Yeah, right. And the kids not fighting or hitting each other in the head with things. Yeah. Like like just a kid on a swing, on. just a swing going back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put that on in your headphones while your kids are yeah. tearing the house apart. You're like, hold on, guys. I'm just yeah. going to a happy you place just, here. You just hear it off in the distance. <laughs> just, just a beer cracking open, uh, like a barbecue. Yeah. Going, <laughs> yeah. Some birds chirping. <laughs> like, like, oh, this sounds <laughs> quiet. I like this. <laughs> Dad, I'm going to go outside for a while. <laughs> Yeah. Every, every bit, every once in a while. The door and then the door, quietly. it's not a slam. And then the door opens up and it goes, dad, we're still outside. Yeah. And then we're closes. doing just great. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing great. We're not fighting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Everything's the sound, perfect. The sound of the couch being sat yeah. on like, okay, yeah. this is great. Yep. 
<laughs> I think we have something here. Um, so Dale Crover, you you <laughs> have uh, you've shot photos of the Melvins. We were talking when we were, when we were pre pre game yeah. for this episode. Um, what is your relationship to the Melvins? And how did uh, that, yeah? Tell me what did, I mean. You're from the Pacific Northwest. They seem to be uh, you know Pacific Northwesty. Stalk- I have a couple yeah. little Melvin stories. Uh, yeah. So even so, when I was in college, my friend Jeff, who I was in in a band with called the Deborah number. Um, oh, the first oh, band I was ever in that great. we just played, uh, I don't know. We probably played five shows. Maybe we practiced a lot though. Okay. And, um, with my friend Kathy played guitar and sang and, um, and they were big. They, they were older than me. I, it was funny at that point, like I was, let's see, I would have been 20, probably from 20 to 22 maybe 21, 22 things. It seemed like forever. We probably only played for six months, <laughs> but it seemed like we played <laughs> for a long like time two years. Time. Yeah. yeah. It was probably six months or it was probably a year. Um, but um, Jeff and Kathy had grown up in Pullman. So, and then uh, Kathy was a, a, a geology professor and um, but she seemed, I mean, they seemed like so old, like they were elder statesmen. I think they were both probably 28, <laughs> probably. Wow. Yeah. 20, maybe 27, 28, maybe at that time. Um, but, you know, but, but so they grew up in Pullman during the era of like the late eighties to the mid nineties. So all those Seattle bands would come through and play the college play in W S cause it's Washington state. And, um, so they had all these crazy stories. They knew all those bands. Like they had seen Alice in Chains when they were like a glam band, you know, <laughs> coming through and, and like Temple of the Dot, like all the, like Green River and Nirvana and um, Pearl Jam, not Pearl Jam, because Pearl Jam wasn't around then. It was after Green River. After, days. but the, yeah. but those guys were in Green River, right? The yeah. Pearl Jam, one of, at least one of them. Yeah. Uh, the Mother Love Bone. Anyway. Yeah, Mother Love Bone. Like they just had, they knew all those people. Tad, um, like all those bands were, they were friends because they'd come through, they'd stay at people's houses and they were like in in that area when that was happening. So during that time <clears throat> or a little bit after when Melvin's got picked up and were doing bigger tours, my friend Jeff ended up being their road manager. Oh, So wow. he had all these stories of going on tour with Melvin's like he was, he was on tour with Melvin's when they, when, when Nirvana brought them out to open for them. So he was in like Europe and in France when Kurt OD'd and he, you know, he just had like these crazy stories. And I was, I mean, at that point, this was like nine, this would have been 95, 96. So, wow, um, wild. so it had only happened like it three years happened. before or wow. yeah, like three, it was like, he had these stories of like, Oh yeah, like three years ago, 92. And I was on tour with, so, so that's how I got introduced to the Melvins was through Jeff. It was like, cause I didn't really know them earlier. I don't think, I mean, I'd probably heard of them, but I hadn't heard them. And then, so I got introduced to them through him, which was amazing. And then, um, and then, so a couple of years later, when I moved to Portland, he had gone back on the road with them and he's like, Hey, we're playing, we're playing at, I don't remember where it was. It wasn't the crystal ballroom. It's one of those places, a big place. Um, come, come through. And so, um, he got me, like I got on the list and it was when, do you remember the VH1 behind the musics? <laughs> Do you I remember, remember those as a concert or as, as a, as, as a, a show, yeah, as a yeah. show. Right. Yeah. And they would pick a person and then they would go through their whole, it was always sad, and it was always sad or whatever. Yeah, it was so do you story. remember the yeah. famous one about Leif Garrett? Oh, right. You were telling right? me about this, right? So, okay, yeah. so Leif Garrett, who was a singer in the seventies, like a child, singer he's an actor so, more than a singer right an or actor no, but he had yeah. put he had put out all like, like 70s albums and yeah. you know whatever it was the yeah. whole thing like the actors yeah. were singers and and um like donny osmond or, yeah you know, exactly same yeah. time frame 
but him and another singer, another kid at that point had gotten, I think I, I believe Leif Garrett got in a car accident and the other kid got paralyzed. Oh, geez. I think you can look it up. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I think that was the whole, and the whole thing with the behind the music was that, that, um, he, he was confronting him. They were talking and Leif Garrett had then his whole life changed and he went down this spiral and drugs and alcohol and whatever, everything else. And so I think as, as just kind of a joke or how the Melvins, how Melvins like, um, operate of like i feel like half of their stuff comes from like you know what would be funny or you know it would be you know it's like you yeah. hear those like or buzz like you know what i'm gonna make an acoustic record and go on yeah. tour or whatever it's like or or they're kind of famous for going in even even um my friend jeff was like you know i remember him talking about buzz saying let's go to every town we have never been to before and so then finding <clears throat> finding these little towns in the middle of nowhere to play like we're going to play an hour and a half outside of Austin in this little tiny bar or whatever. So they have just always keeping things new. Somehow they came up with the idea of like, we should cover smells like teen spirit and have Leif Garrett sing it. Right. So this <laughs> yeah. is, I feel like maybe they pitched it and this was right after the VH one thing. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So they put out a seven inch of, Smells like Teen Spirit. Uh, as far as I know, this is how I remember it. You could probably look this up and go, "No, there's no seven inch." I don't know. What you're talking about. <laughs> it looks as like far it's as the, I remember they did a single. the Melvins record, "The Cry Baby," the twelfth studio <clears throat> album by American rock band The Melvins. Has Leif Garrett? Yes, on it. Record doing recording. Well, this looks like, like it's. This looks like these are all um, or a lot of um, covers. Okay. So maybe they did a covers record yeah. and they got him to sing smells like teen spirit. So then, so that happens right before this tour, they're like, we should call Leif Garrett and see if he will come on tour with us. Cause he lived in LA and they live right. in LA and they call him and he's like, yeah, here's my address. <laughs> come pick me up. <laughs> and they're into like a van <clears throat> and <clears throat> they go to pick him up and he's outside with his duffel bag or whatever, jumps in the van and he's on there. He's on tour with the Melvins. So, <laughs> so they do their whole set. They might've even been opening. The, it was the, the um, tour where they were opening for themselves and I could be mixing shows up, <laughs> but I think the slow Melvins were opening up for the heavy Melvins. So, so, again, this is what I'm remembering that they opened up playing like all the slow songs and then they went away and changed, changed outfits and came back as like the fast heavy Melvins. <laughs> something, it was something like that. Yeah. This again, this was like 20, this would have been 25 years ago. This would have been 99. <clears throat> it was right before I moved to LA and, um, or so it might've even been early 2000. And so, uh, I get to the, I get there and, um, it's before the show and I walk in and Jeff's there, we're talking and I look over and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm sitting next to Leif Garrett. On the couch. <laughs> this is where you went to the show. Yeah. Yeah. This is when yeah. I went to the show and it's before the show started. And so I'm sitting next to Leif Garrett on the couch and I'm going, oh, this is so crazy, but I only really knew him from the VH one thing, but the VH one thing had just come out or had come out somewhat recently. So it was a big thing that he was sober. And then it was like this whole thing. He had had this life changing thing. And, um, so, and I was moving to LA and I was talking to Leif Garrett and I had this, all, this will all come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> I had a Subaru <laughs> at the time and I'm like, Oh yeah, man, I'm moving to LA in a couple months or whatever. And, and he is like, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. LA's amazing. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but it, I, I don't know if I need a car there. Um, which was the stupid thing at this point. I'm yeah. like, I think I need to sell my car. 
to get money to go there. I have a Subaru. And he's like, oh, man, you definitely got to sell your Subaru here. You can't sell it in L.A. No one's going to buy a Subaru in L.A., man. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to Leif Garrett about whether good, I should sell my good Subaru. good advice, and I, especially yeah, in was, the 90s or early 2000s. Yeah, now people yeah. sell p- people buy Subarus here, but man, back yeah. then. So I sold, no so, one knew what uh, it was. So, yeah. so Leif Garrett gave me the idea to sell my Subaru in Portland before I left. <laughs> and uh, I talked to Jeff for a bit. I never, I don't know if I, I, I'm sure I didn't talk to, but I sure I would have been like, oh, what do I have to say to Buzz? I'm not going to, these guys yeah. are like heroes <laughs> never talk never meet your heroes right um but then uh, so the show was amazing and then at one point i went out the backstage to like get fresh air i don't know and and um i allegedly i don't know you know <laughs> i see leif garrett just chugging a bottle of jack daniels <laughs> oh out in the van by himself or near the van or something. I, I just saw him like drinking. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I thought the whole thing was that he was sober. <laughs> but that's um, what the VH1 like, special oh would have God, you believe. This is this is gonna be yeah. this is gonna be interesting. And then uh, This is before the show, before he played. <clears throat> yeah. And so they do the whole thing. They do the Melvins and then they come out for their encore and they're like, We have a special guest. And they bring Leif Garrett out and they play smells like teen spirit live and um he's singing it and he is allegedly wasted out of his mind can't even barely talk oh, no. and it's like you know and it's just like oh no oh my god this is gonna go so bad but it's you know it was it was fine but then he was like I don't know. I remember talking on the mic and trying to say stuff and just being like, oh, and this was like two shows into the tour, right? They were, they come up from, from LA. So I think they were like LA, San Francisco. Like they were, they were pretty much just starting the tour. And then um, I guess it ended up, the story was that they pretty much, he pretty much just used it as a free ride to the East coast. And then he bailed on the, (laughs) <laughs> he bailed on the he bailed on the tour in New York. Like once they got that's to New York, he's good. like, "Okay, guys, I think this is all I can handle." And I'm sure that's really, all they can handle just, too. At some point, it's just yeah. like, oh, "How long can you do this?" But supposedly they had they had like they were just had crazy stories the whole time. They would just get him to tell stories. Oh wow! And um and I'm sure as of things back then, like the, the story, like someone probably I'm sure someone probably recorded him telling all these crazy stories. But he had. <clears throat> he just had all these crazy stories from the seventies and eighties and and all that. So anyway, that's my, that's my best. So that's where I was at with Melvin's and then, um, and then f- fast forward to, I don't know, probably 10 years after that, that, um, um, the band big business who, who oh, hold on. Well, before we move off, leave Garrett uh, though, I'm just, I'm just, I'm yeah. looking up his thing, but he, do you think this was this must have been some type of like comment on well you know on their their idea of of Kurt Cobain or Nirvana or sort of what it all yeah. meant you know what I mean the sort of like you know obviously they were friends with Kurt Cobain but then yeah. somehow still taking the piss out of the legacy of whatever Nirvana was at that point you know this many years after his death that but, like you know like you could just replace him with Leaf Garrett or something with like a seventies teen heartthrob. I so, think, right. I mean, there's some sort of statement about their something about, you know, this has to do with Nirvana, obviously covering t- smells like teen spirit with a seventies, totally. good looking guy. Is this part of that? But you like know a washed I mean? up, like a washed up old seventies. Yeah. But also I always thought like, I'm sure because they all grew up together and this is me. Not Supposing anything. Yeah. Yeah. But that them all growing up together and being punk and being like probably idiots and like doing stupid stuff and having bands that had horrible names and, you know, like yeah. all of that stuff that you do when you're kids. Right. That Kurt that would think this, this would just would be funny. Would be hilarious. It'd be like, yeah, oh, my God, the joke. This, this the joke is this is maybe one of the best jokes ever that you guys would cover smells like Teen Spirit as a joke. Yeah. With like. The, the hero, worst idea, the, childhood. the worst yeah. idea of like the TV, like the kid that we probably made fun of. I mean, because they're old enough to where he would have been popular yeah. when they were kids. 
that or they, looked up they, to or thought he was the coolest maybe. or something. You know what I mean? Was that or maybe, of thing of like, maybe one, I mean, or just he represented like everything that they hated. Who knows? I don't know. Right. You yeah, know, yeah. But, but that, that I always thought like, Oh, this would be one of those things that, that they pro that Kurt probably would have thought was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, are you guys kidding me? Especially with that song, Smells Like Teen Spirit, that they kind of like, Right. Because the very last, it and became the huge thing. But also was the very last song that they recorded on Nevermind, right? And that that also has been, I mean, like Dave Grohl was like, oh my God, that's just a Pixies ripoff. And we we really thought that like everyone's going to go. Oh, well, everyone's going to just think that song's a Pixies ripoff. It's not like a, it's not going to be the, the, the number one hit song. song we'll just put it out first life, yeah. and then we'll put out the other ones and then it just becomes the most massive song ever and it was kind of a not a throwaway song but it was the last song that they recorded um yeah. but yeah so all of that stuff i think probably culminating in the mel in the melvin's um uh recording it with leif garrett was probably a great bookend to that song <laughs> that's insane especially since nirvana now has become so popular with with kids oh god and and the t-shirts i mean it's probably one of the most popular t-shirts that you see for you know, kids it used now to be obey it used to be like oh. you know obey stuff you'd see obey everywhere oh yeah i mean every like every day even in where i'm teaching like every day someone has a nirvana shirt on that's crazy yeah i I mean i've seen it with with some kids yeah i mean it was kind of like i don't know i would i would say they're like the led zeppelin of when when we were kids and you'd buy if you wanted to buy like a 70s shirt it would be like the led zeppelin for like the angel right the right shirt with the guy with the wings going up into the sky or whatever it's so funny yeah i don't that, think i ever owned a nirvana shirt as much as i loved the band <clears throat> i never did i don't yeah, yeah. because it always felt but like it, too like they didn't really have like a shirt they had like the, the weird smiley face one and i don't that almost yeah. felt like a joke or like a a con on the fans yeah too it's just like fuck yeah. off like we don't want to sell shirts but if or we the, if you need to have a shirt we're gonna draw we're gonna make this really dumb one and it yeah. said something fucked up on the back i forget it was like crack smoking alcohol oh, right something 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 on the back I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah you can't wear that to middle school yeah or the and then after that it would have been the um in utero like the anatomy oh god yeah, yeah. with the wings or whatever yeah. but then but i mean for me though i was i was into nirvana and then by the time like i went to college they i don't want to say like they were things had moved on a little bit Mm -hmm. i don't know like in utero was a massive record but it was but people were listening to like ice cube and (laughs) rage against the machine and all these other bands that had kind of spawned out of that post grunge thing thing. yeah i mean and pearl jam was making like more conceptual records and you know whatever like it had I don't want to say it had moved on, but it was like, oh yeah, Nirvana, that's cool. I don't know. Right. They weren't. They weren't as they're they're legendary now. In that time of like ninety two, that that last year, they were. I don't want to say they were on the downturn, but because <laughs> it wasn't. But it it wasn't what it. Nobody was going. Oh my god, this is like the best crazy. This Nirvana is going to be around forever. This is going to be the band that is encapsulates this whole thing. They were just Nirvana. They were the band, right? And I don't, yeah, because I wasn't, I didn't really listen to them that much later. And then until maybe three or four, well, God, it seemed like three or four, but it's probably just a couple of years later. And a friend of mine who was just really into lyrics and songs and was like, had to sit down and go, like, no, no, look at the way that he wrote lyrics. Look at the way that he, like, <laughs> turned his like you know the his songwriting upside down with the you oh, know it's geez. like oh yeah i never really thought about that <laughs> you know how different they were and now you look back and you're like no nirvana is just nirvana there's not a band that there's a band a lot of bands that have tried to sound like them and have never really gotten whatever that thing was with kurt songwriting but anyway i don't know where, yeah. how i got on that i don't know but yeah well it's, it's it's interesting just to try to think about yeah like the kind of the the 
the context of the time. Okay, yeah. and then what was and then and then fast forward from Leaf Garrett telling you to sell your Subaru, oh, right. and then you, <laughs> so you're living in L.A. and then they're they're doing the big the big Melvins, what do they call it? Yeah, <clears throat> like the big business Melvins, big combo. business Melvins combo. Yeah, and um, this is like <clears throat> late aughts, like probably 2008, 2009. Yeah, something like probably. That. Yeah, yeah, and um, <clears throat> I got asked to shoot them, and I was like, oh, does that say? Okay, I got the email to shoot the Melvins. It was like, here's, I don't know who, I don't remember who was setting it up. I probably was actually talking to Jared from Big Mm -hmm. Business. And um, I was like, well, why don't you just meet? Was it for a magazine or what was it for? Yeah, it was for a magazine. Okay. I don't remember what what magazine it was for. Um, And then it was for, oh, wait, shoot. It was for a magazine that was out of Chicago. Um. Uh, no. Chris Force ran it. Huh. Uh, oh my God, why can't I remember it? Because this was actually it was actually the cover. Buzz was on the cover. Huh. Uh, Ooh, your photo. Yeah. The photo you shot of him. <clears throat> yeah. Um, oh my God, Alarm. Oh. Do you remember okay. that magazine, Alarm magazine? No. <clears throat> they dealt with a lot of stuff, but I'll, I shot a couple kind of heavier bands for them. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if I got. Maybe think I found e the article. The eels. Do you remember the eels? I yeah, shot a yeah. couple. Of, I would shoot a couple of bands for them every year. Okay. Um, they were awesome. They were, and they were the best too, because it would be like, yeah, do whatever. <laughs> like they did. They didn't have like a lot of stringent rules and ideas, goofy ideas. <laughs> but um, uh, I I'm pretty sure it was for alarm. Yeah, it was for alarm. Anyway, they they called and I was like, "Oh, I've made it." Are you kidding me? I'm shooting the <laughs> band portrait of the Melvins. It's amazing. And then, um, and then I knew the guys from Big Business a little bit too, so it was cool. And and um, it was awesome. They all showed up, and I don't I don't remember. I do feel like it was Jared's idea, or it was one of their idea. They're like, "Hey, we're all gonna bring our dogs," <laughs> and. Um, maybe we could figure out how to do a, like a band portrait with the dogs. And so we shot some other stuff without the dogs, but they were, it was pretty bland and kind of boring. And then like, well, let's do the dogs. And then, and then of course, yeah, it had to be Jared because Jared brought a dog costume. <laughs> you can see him. He's, he's on his, he's on his knees in the background and he's got like a, he's got like a furry cape, like a cape on that has a hood. Oh, how and, funny. And he's like, has his, tongue out and he's like acting like a dog so yeah they're all holding their own dogs and they're in in the living room and i don't remember whose house it was it um it was jared's house or i don't know i don't remember whose house it was it was a nice little house i don't remember somewhere in la atwater or something maybe um but yeah it was really it was really fun and all those guys are awesome i mean i think i've met buzz just a couple times or just been in conversations where he's talking and he's just always seems like the nicest um you know he's funny most chill guy (laughs) oh there he is now he's calling you now to say hi stop talking about me (laughs) this is all false (laughs) uh but um that's awesome but yeah no it was it was great and it was one of those moments of like that i think um that like one reason my photography career lasted as long as it did but also one of the reasons my photography career was always kind of shoddy at best (laughs) was that I really, um, I really loved the idea of having this job that put me in weird situations with people that, um, you know, I got to take their picture or whatever, but really I just got to be in the room in these interesting situations and talking to these people who I really respected and who are artists and creative and being able to like, you know, pulling up to someone's house and going, Oh man, this is weird. <laughs> this is <laughs> That's really what you weird. Lived for. You know, like, that was the juice of, of, yeah, the, of the assignment. Like, I think, I think like, like, and it was the thing that I never realized, you know, I went to, I, I got a photo degree, but I came out of school. No, I didn't know anything about, I knew how to print my own images and I knew some, a little bit about conceptual stuff, but I didn't know anything about the business of photography. And I ended up working with a photographer in Portland named Morgan Henry for a couple of years. And, and he was like 
commercial, you know, shoot stuff for Nike and we'd go on, on trips and, and, uh, you know, it was also, he's shot all, all sorts of stuff, but also experimented with different processes and stuff and really went, I just went like, wow, this is a job. It's crazy. <laughs> like this is sometimes, yeah, it can be if you, turns out you need to know things about business as well. Which, yeah. <laughs> which took me a long time to realize I never learned, but that, but that, uh, but the the greatest thing to me was that every couple of days it was totally different, you know, you're like, all right, let's pack up the car and go to this computer chip manufacturer. And we're going to get in like full suits. So we're, we don't have any electric conductivity and we're going to shoot, intel chips coming off the line or whatever you know it's like wild and then the next day and the next day you're like holding cameras and he's shooting and this is when i was assisting and he's climbing up a tree and shooting photos of a environmentalist to 100 feet up in a tree and then the next wow. you know it's like yeah this was like whoa this is you're just being put into these crazy situations and so then i feel like that's once I started shooting my own stuff and I had moved to LA and um, to do stuff for buddy head of all things, because I knew <laughs> Travis from, cause he grew up in Idaho <clears throat> through skateboarding and then coming down here and like getting a couple odd jobs, but then for after a year shooting and shooting mostly music and then thinking like at that point, like just jobs would just come, you'd meet people and then they'd end up working for a magazine and then, you'd get the call like, Hey, can you uh, drive out to Malibu tomorrow morning and <laughs> shoot this band? They're here for an hour. Um, they're going to meet <laughs> you at the beach. And uh, we just need like two close up portraits and a band shot. It's 50 bucks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> awesome. Yep. I'll be 100%. there. Yeah. And so, so much of my stuff was just like, you know, it was just that. So then you get a call about Melvin's and you're like, wow, it happened. I feel like this was the band for me, right? especially yeah. like the, the independent bands that it was like, Oh, I couldn't even think of a, I couldn't even think of a better, a, a band that would top them on my list of bands that I would have wanted to shoot, you know? Yeah. And so, especially to have it go well and to have it be like maybe one of my most interesting band portraits <laughs> with the dogs in it, in someone's <laughs> living room. And, 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 uh, and it was just like, yeah, this, and I walked away going, well, that, that was, was awesome. It. <laughs> it's I'm all done. downhill Time to pack it up. <laughs> yeah, it's all downhill from here. And the next, uh, 15 years mm -hmm. were just, you know, it just slowly okay. got worse. You're riding that high. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, like the reason yeah. you and I know each other is because of photography. Right? Of course. Because yeah, of, yeah, like, yeah. I shot a video. I mean, I knew you a little bit before that, but I shot a video of you and Dean for monster children, I think like that weird inter interview oh. video and the like oh, yeah, the projectors yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And but then, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, we, we just saw Tara Tavi and uh, Sam McFeeders the other day and uh, she were, she was reminding us about the story that Shannon wrote about teachers in bands. Oh yeah. That you shot totally. that, the cover oh, yeah. of whatever was that called? Shot, it was exactly. Alternative press or yeah. What that alternative, one was called, the, or, the cover yeah. of alternative press. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was great. Well, and, and that actually would have been yeah. the, probably the first time we officially met. Right. Yeah. I've probably had seen your band. You probably seen my band, but yeah. yeah. I remember, yeah we, we and I knew Dean. Hanging out there. I, mean, I knew Dean since I sure. moved right when I moved here, but yeah, but um, yeah, but it's so funny, but all the photography is just that was that gateway for me, especially because I don't, I don't, I'm not like a super outgoing person that's going to walk up and talk to people. So, <laughs> or, and even like band, especially bands or anything, but I realized when I lived in Portland, like I had a camera, especially back then, there weren't that many photographers. And um, if there was a band that I liked, I'd like find out like the who knew that person and just like, oh, where do they work? Oh, they work at Jackpot Records. Oh, cool. I'll go in there. I'm like, hey, I take photos. Um, can I get can I um, get on the list for your next show if I give you some photos afterwards? I'm like, yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> That's how easy. much i'm like no just get me on the list i just need practice like taking photos and i'll give you some prints and so then i met and that's how i ended up like by the time i was done with port in portland like the, right before i was leaving elliot smith came by came back to play and it was like that whole group of people and i got to shoot some photos of him playing live which were i've told this story many times of like 
that that whole night was like all the photos that I didn't take <laughs> were the ones <laughs> I remember in my head. But that, but like just all of those, like, oh yeah, this camera, this camera is like this, it's like my access card to meet people and to be like yeah. my buffer of like, yeah, if I didn't have this camera, I would never talk to you. And I would be <laughs> like, uh, hey, I'm going to, uh, so, uh, but it gave me like a job to do, right? It was yeah. like, well, I have, I, I feel useful. I feel like useful in this situation and I can be around all these super cool artistic weirdos and, and I can have like a little chunk of being useful. It's like, I can go like at any point I can just go, Oh, I have photos of you and like, Hey, use this for a record or whatever. It's like, it doesn't matter, but this kind of gets me into, to be able to, you know, be in this scene and gave you reason to be, to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of permission. Like, It's like, I'm not just hanging around like, trying to feed off of everybody's energy or whatever. It's like, no, I, <laughs> I have a use, you know, I have a use and I still get calls. Now. Contributing. Like, like my friends in Dios who I shot photos for, for like a year are putting out something coming up and they just called for a bunch of photos and it's and amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. I love so, it. That, yeah, was, that was like 15 years ago, you know? <laughs> and so, so when those moments happen, I'm like, Oh yeah. Hey, I was useful. <laughs> I did have a purpose, it's, guys. <laughs> well, it's the gift that keeps on giving. In that, like yeah. you know, now that there's an archive that exists, and the value of that is like so relevant to whatever happens with well, the band and, or with the artist or with the, with the celebrity or whatever it is, you know. Totally. And when we just had to leave our house for a week, you know, because of the fires and stuff, that the only thing I brought was like three filing cabinet drawers of negatives. Oh, wow. And hard drives. Oh, so that's why you're going through the, yeah, so you were seeing all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, so that's why when out. I was yeah, sending yeah, yeah. you those photos, yeah. I was like, I was putting everything back away and I found a folder of old oh. crappy prints and <laughs> all these things. And I'm like, oh my God. And do, I'm like, does this say 2006? Oh. <laughs> <Like> that <laughs> should have been better you, by then. <laughs> well, and that yeah. was another one in that in that same pile. I found a, um, an image, this, this photo that I took of Rick Rubin, which was <laughs> outside of... Um, we were just at a show at the Troubadour and I would think it was this band, your enemy's friends. And it might've been the Icarus line maybe, Okay. but I, I remember it being um, your enemy's friends and that we were just outside and then Rick Rubin walked out and, and this was like, God, this, it was on film. So this must've been probably 2003, maybe. I don't know. It was, and it was just with a point and shoot. And I remember him walking out. And I had my camera and I was like, Hey Rick, can I take your picture? And he was like, yeah, sure. And he just backed up against the wall and looked at me and I had like one image and I shot it and it's just like, thanks. And was just like, I officially live in Los Angeles. <laughs> like that was the moment. And the, the, and I feel like I had been here for a couple of years, but I always just kind of felt like I lived in a cartoon, like, you know, yeah. I was like, LA was so crazy. It, be, I moved here when I was 25 and then coming from Portland, which Portland has a little bit of craziness, but LA was just like, like this place is crazy every single night. It's crazy. And like <laughs> people are crazy and the place is crazy. And the things that people like, it's like, Hey, we're going to go to this party. And you're like, are we at, at like rivers Cuomo's house <laughs> you know, or whatever you just show yeah. up at this, like you find yourself wait, places. What? And they're like, yeah, so-and-so works for the manager that is at this place. And, and you just are in a carload of people that are at some, you know, whatever it was, it was yeah. just nuts, but I never felt like I lived here. I felt like I was kind of visiting and that photo of taking a photo of Rick Rubin and going, I was like, Nope, I'm here. This is it. This is, <laughs> this is real. This is yeah. the reality of totally. it all. Yeah. Well, we, always funny. be ready. Always have your camera on. Yeah. Ready. You never know yeah. you're going to see. It's funny. It's wild. Oh, man. All right. Well, I think I think that's good. Awesome. I, uh, I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad you guys survived the fire. Hopefully yeah. you survive whatever gets thrown at you next. Yeah. This well, I'm, I'm bummed that I missed the um, Steve Keen. The, uh, oh, uh, yes. That one. That was such a good interview. I loved it. Oh, and yeah. I saw, I saw you yeah. guys play at that, that book release. I was there. Which book release? The Steve Keen book release. Didn't you, you do be, that? Yeah. Oh, you right. and Dean played in that little was corner. That? You played yeah. like electronic music, and right. it was like right. The, was it for um, that book? Yeah. Oh my god, I don't even remember. Okay. Yeah, gosh, because yeah. that was wild. And it and it was right when things were kind of starting to open up from COVID. COVID ness. Yeah. Because I remember right. Dean was like super Fully masked. masked. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then face and shield. Then, um, yes. 
we were all yeah i think everybody uh, was pretty masked up and stuff so it was like it must have been right before we moved because okay. michelle was yeah. there too must have been right before oh, funny we, we moved but um but anyway yeah yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, was Daniel great... was cool. Yeah, it was a very, it was an interesting one to, to just kind of just dig into all of that. I mean, Steve yeah. is a prolific mf'er. I mean, it's yeah. it's a wild one. You really think like, what? How does this? How does this? What work? Is, what? What's the final goal here? It's just yeah. it's, it's it's almost like yeah, like it's, it's beyond perception or There's conception no of just like yeah, just keep making the work like, is the goal. That is it. Yeah, the every day, and I don't know if you've seen it, but just the pictures of him—he's like in a little like um, chain link fence cage yeah. with like so like, he can like hang all his canvases stuff, right? all all around him. He does one color at a time. Mm-hmm. He literally does it like a factory. It's like well, I watched Andy him Warhol do some of the thing. the live painting at that event. Oh, he had it. He had his whole setup in the back, and he had he had some pieces up, and, and he was doing like the one 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 at a time. Oh, he had made some paintings at the place. That's crazy. And then I, I think they were that. trying. I... They were trying to. Say, well, I was there earlier because of J, because um, of JC. Yeah. And and then um, he was kind of showing me around. And then and then, uh, you know, they were trying to like sell his work for. You know, I, I remember them being like, "Yeah, this is going to be a blah blah blah." And he's like, "And and I don't remember what had happened, but like, it had already been sold out." And then it was for like 20 bucks a piece. And they're like, <laughs> they're like oh, wait, what? <laughs> or something. I don't remember exactly what had happened, but something had happened where it was like, yeah, we sold all of them or whatever. And then it was yeah. way less than they thought. I, I don't know what it was. <laughs> but it seemed perfect during the interview. Then like listening to that interview, I was like, oh, that that's why. Because I didn't yeah. understand. I didn't know that much about his process. I knew that I knew his paintings. And I had had yeah. a friend in the early 2000s tell me about Steve Keen and that he had gone to a Steve Keen show or maybe a show where he was selling stuff. And he was like, yeah, look, I got these at this table, this guy that makes these these paintings for like 20 bucks a piece and or 10 bucks at that point or whatever. And I was like, wow, that seems like a lot of work for 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough way to make but, an easy living. Yeah. Yeah. But it's on totally. but it's on it's on scale. It's on mass. If you can do that, yeah. you can do but now you see them on eBay week. selling for like a thousand dollars and stuff. It's That's like wild. the aftermarket for some of those things is kind of crazy. That's wild. But love it. Love it. All yeah, right, man. man. Well, I will see you uh, uh next week. Next week. I hope yeah. you have, hope you have a good week. With this Thursday we have Aaron Hemphill from the band uh, Liars now with his own solo project non Oh. Awesome. He has a new record coming out. And um, yeah, and I talked to him. I caught up with him. He's in uh, Berlin. Oh, awesome! So, yeah, I had, shot liars a couple talk. times. There we go. Hey. That's how I met Julian <laughs> for the first time. Yeah, it's, it's a small world. Awesome. And then, and then after after Aaron, I have a a, a top secret guest Ooh. that I'll be really excited to uh, to announce as it gets closer. Amazing. Somebody, yeah, so it'll be fun. It'll be fun to hear a conversation. So cool. yeah, more fun stuff. And I'm awesome. kind of, con- oh yeah, I think I'm kind of considering this like season two. I think we've made it for a year. I think somehow the year blew past really? us. Really? Yeah, somewhere wow. in August, I think was where it happened. How many of you? So done? I kind of, kind of try to draw. I mean, is it? I don't 50? know. Well, like if there's once a week. Yeah, there's one one interview a week, and it's been over a year, so it had to be fifty two there. Yeah. And we've done, I think, at least one of these, you know, a week. We started these time. from the very beginning, right? I think so. Yeah. I think we've been, this has been going pretty good. So like puts it somewhere at 104, maybe a little bit over, but I kind of took the Dale Crover one. I was like, okay, let me just say that's beginning season, of season two. Season beginner. Yeah. Nice. I think that's an easy sort of line. I'll remember that. Remember, yeah. It was okay, awesome. No I mean, it was problem. awesome hearing Dale was, talk to like all of his stories and stuff. And that new record is amazing. Yeah. It sounds great. Doesn't it's it? It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Really good. It's not what I expected. <laughs> I was like, oh, what do I expect from a, from a new Dale Crover record? And then listening to it, I was like, I think you you said it too, mm-hmm. is like it clean. You're like, I don't know if yeah. this is a bad thing to say, but I, <laughs> I felt the same way too. I'm like, oh, it sounds it sounds like really clean and fresh. Like it yeah. it just has like a really I don't know bright bright feeling to it. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but it was really like I listened to it driving home all. Uh, Driving him on my way home on Friday it was nice. Yeah, definitely different than a Melvin's record. You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't feel like he's just doing the same thing without no, one of the totally members. Unique. It's like it's a whole, it's his own like kind of perspective. And he even talks about it in the interview. You know that he's been writing songs for so long. He started off Forever, as a guitar yeah. player, and it's like 
which is one of those yeah. things, you know, that he's been got sidetracked as a drummer for the last 30 years, 40, 40 years. <laughs> sidetracked as one of the best heavy drummers of all <laughs> yeah. times. But I think in, in, in his heart, he still feels like he's a, he's a, you know, he's, he's a guitarist. He's a guitar yeah. yeah. So, it's awesome. so it's incredible. Yeah. It's great that he does these records. Yeah. So, so cool. Awesome. All right. Well, I will, uh, I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Be well Randy. out there, everybody. All right.